we're going to jump right in tonight. Uh, last week, we, uh, we had a talk called Positioned with Purpose. And, and the whole idea of last week, if you missed it, was, you know, it's just too easy to, to get caught up in life and caught up with everything that, that's going on and, and just kind of enter into a phase where you're just existing, you're just coasting, you're just surviving, you're just getting through. But we looked at the story of Esther last week, and we were taking some practical application to, to remind ourselves that there is actually purpose in every season of life, that, that there isn't a season or stage of life that you walk through that, that doesn't have purpose attached to it. And how when you can come to the understanding and the realization to be like, you know what, maybe this isn't my favorite season of life, or maybe it is the best season of life that I've had. God, you have a purpose for my life in this season. When you can begin to accept that idea and get that into your heart, then, then that will awaken something inside of you to be more intentional, to be more away, uh, aware, to be more disciplined with, with really seeking God and what he has for you in this season of life. And so tonight I kind of want to jump off of that message, and, and uh, I've entitled this tonight, Not Too Few. Say, Not Too Few. Not Too Few. We're going to be looking at a story in 2 Kings chapter 4, a uh, really short story, but a powerful one, a story that I've preached on so many times, and, and I love preaching from this story. It's amazing. If you don't have your Bibles, you can follow up on the screen. We're going to go through this real quick. It says that the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you in the house? And she said, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels, and not too few. Someone say not too few. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons, and pour into all these vessels. When one is full, set it aside. So she went from him, and she shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil, pay off your debts, and you and your sons can live off the rest. Now, I want to give you a little bit of context to this story. Elisha is the prophet at the time. Now, this is way before Jesus ever came and died on the cross so that you and I now have the, the opportunity, the privilege of having direct communication with God. You know, you and I can, can pray wherever we're at, whenever, and we can actually communicate with God. We have the Holy Spirit available to us. This is way before any of that. So at this time, um, in history, the only communication that an average person like you and I could have with God would be through a priest or a prophet. They, they represented the word of the Lord for that time. So when God wanted to communicate to his people, he would communicate through his prophet or through a priest. So, so this woman is seeking the word of the Lord for her life. So, so this would be the equivalent of you and I coming to God present day, but she has to go to this, this prophet. Now, she is coming to him in absolute desperation. I'm sure everyone in here can, can relate to a time when finances are tight, when, when finances are bringing some stress into life, and, and you're looking at, at, at your debit account, you're looking at your credit card account, and you're like, things just are not adding up. Things are way off, and I don't know what I'm going to do, and it causes all this stress and anxiety and this woman is on a whole nother level, okay? This woman is so broke. Not only is her husband dead, but she is so broke. She owes so much money that the creditors have informed her that they are going to come and take her two children from her and put them into slavery. Not only has she lost her husband, she's about to lose her two children because she literally has nothing left. So this, this woman, when she is asking for a word from the Lord, she is coming because that is all she has left. This is her last resort. There is nothing that she can do. This problem is so overwhelming. She is so desperate. She needs something from God. Now, what I respect about this woman is she's not just coming in desperation, but you can sense a little frustration in her voice. When, when, when she's speaking to Elisha, you know, she's saying, you know who my husband was. You know that my husband feared the Lord. You know that my husband served the Lord. 
How many people in here can relate to a time where you have tried to make good decisions? You have tried to make the right choices. You have tried to, to follow the Lord and do what you feel like you're supposed to do. And maybe life still has not worked out the way that you planned, worked out the way that you thought. There is a level of frustration of saying like, you know, we, we were trying to do what's right. My husband loved the Lord. He feared the Lord. We tried to do everything, and yet he still died, and yet I have nothing, and I'm about to lose my two kids. She is coming to him so honest and open and frustrated and desperate, just saying, I need God to do something. I need God to speak to me. Now, when, when you have that context and the reason why she's coming to Elisha and you can, you can look through just words and hear the desperation and frustration in her voice, when you reread this story, Elisha's response seems a little cold. Elisha doesn't seem super compassionate in the moment, but, but it's what Elisha begins to ask her and say to her that changes everything for her. It's how Elisha handles the situation that opens the door for God to perform this incredible miracle that not only solves her current issue, but sets her and her family up for life. And so I want to just walk through for a couple minutes what Elisha is asking her, what Elisha is pointing out to her, how, how he's instructing her to navigate the situation because we can apply it to our everyday life. So the first thing that I want to point out to you is that Elisha asked her, what do you have in the house? What do you have in the house? I don't know about you, but that seems a little insensitive to me. When, when, when someone's coming to you saying, I have nothing, to put it back on them and say, what do you have? They're like, okay, you want to play that game. I just told you my kids are about to be taken from me. Elisha says, what do you have in the house? He is getting her to acknowledge what she does have and what she doesn't have. Now, even when she's able to, to take an, an account of what she does and doesn't have, it's so obvious that what she does have does not equate to where she wants to be or where she, she needs to be. But what it does do is it does remind her, like, yeah, only God could fix this. O -o only God could do this. Now, now when he asked her, her, her first response, her natural response, I don't have anything. Well, except I do have a little oil. But literally, that's it. Literally, that's it. You know, th this is how you and I go through life. When, when we're frustrated and we're desperate for God to do something, it is so easy to overlook the thing that we could be doing, the thing that we do have to give, the little commitment that we could make, and just be frustrated that God isn't fixing the whole problem. Even when she is justified in being desperate and frustrated, Elisha is still putting the attention on, but what do you have? When you acknowledge what you could be doing, what you could be giving, what you could be committing, even sometimes when all you could do is pray. Uh, that's literally all you could do. Maybe the only thing that you could do in this relationship or this circumstance or this situation is just to pray. But are you really praying? Are you really being faithful to take time out on a daily basis and bring it before the Lord? Are you really asking God in your prayers, God, I want to see this how you see this. So I don't want to just come to you with my agenda and how I think things should work out. But, but God, I want to see it from your perspective. I need you to do something. So even if it doesn't pan out the way that I want, God, you need to move. When you acknowledge what you could be doing, what you could be giving, it gives you skin in the game. So many of us, we just approach things and situations and relationships and, and, and certain people in life with this set it and forget it mentality. Okay, God, I'm going to give it to you, and then I'll feel entitled to just be frustrated with you when the whole thing doesn't work out. And we never take a, the moment to take ownership of the situation and be like, but there is some things that I could be doing. Even if it seems menial, even if it doesn't seem like that would equate to what I need to happen, I'll be faithful with I, what I could do and trust that God will do what only he could do. He's saying, what, what do you have in the house? Isn't it so profound that Elisha's response to her, he asked her two questions back to back and he never even gives her the chance to answer. <clears throat> she comes to him with this problem. His response is, well, what do you want me to do? What do you have in the house? He doesn't even give her a chance to answer what she wants him to do. 
he follows that up with, well, what do you have in the house? He is, is showing her what you have is directly connected to what you need. There, there, there is an element of surrender and faithfulness and obedience with what you do have, with what you could be doing, and what you need God to do. And so he is asking her, could you just for a moment figure out what you have? Her response is, I have nothing, well, actually, except a little jar of oil. See, God looks for the except. God loves the except. God works through the except. It's, it's when you and I are weak that he's strong. It's when we have nothing left that then he gives everything. It's when you and I reach our end that then he can begin and say, now this is where I show up. She says, I, I have nothing except a little jar of oil. It, it's the little thing that you do have that's meant to play a role in the bigger thing that God desires to do in your life. How cool is this? She's coming to the Lord, or coming to Elisha for a word from the Lord of what to do. Notice, she doesn't get instruction and direction from Elisha until she acknowledges what she could be doing. Do you know how many times, I, I was saying this on Sunday, I got so convicted Sunday morning in my truck praying about this message, about an area of my life that I, to be honest with you, have been a little frustrated with God because it hasn't worked out how I thought it was going to. And I felt, as I'm reading this, that the Holy Spirit was like, but have you really been praying about it? Have you really been bringing it before me? Have you really been doing what you could be doing? Even though to you it might not amount to, to getting to where, where it needs to be, have you been faithful with what you could be doing? So many times I get frustrated with God because I'm not getting a word. I don't feel like I'm getting direction. I don't feel like things are being answered. I don't feel like things are being worked out. But yet I'm overlooking the very thing that I should be working on. It's when she acknowledges there is one thing that I could give. There's one thing that I, that I could work with. That Then that opens the door for Elisha to give her instruction and direction. Second thing I want to ask you tonight is when you identify what you do have or what you could be doing, what you could be being faithful with, are you willing to put that to work? Are you willing to put that to work? She's coming to him so overwhelmed, so overwhelmed. I mean, I get overwhelmed with a bunch of little things. I cannot even imagine how you would be feeling with things on this level, this, this magnitude. She's completely overwhelmed. Elisha takes her attention and her focus on everything that she's facing, on everything that's overwhelming her, and he narrows her focus down to the little thing that she does have that she could put to work. When she realizes, you know what, I do have a little jar of oil, this is the instruction that Elisha gives. He says, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels, and not too few. Someone say not too few. He says, then go in, shut the door behind yourself and your sons, and pour into all these vessels, and when one is full, set it aside. I want to look at that, these instructions really quick. He's saying, go borrow from your neighbors. So he's basically saying, involve other people in your problems. Now, when you have problems, the last thing that you want to do is involve other people in your problems because it's embarrassing. It's humiliating. Sometimes when I'm, I'm facing things, sometimes that are out of my control, sometimes are a result of things that were inside of my control, the last thing that I want to do is be vulnerable with somebody else. But, but you being who you were called to be and you be ending up where God has, has, has called you to be is not independent of others. It's dependent on you involving others and being connected with others. You being a part of the body of Christ. So, so his instruction to her is, okay, I want you to go borrow vessels from your neighbors. Now, let's not gloss over this for a second. He is asking her when she is already in debt. To the point where creditors are taking your kids. Hey, I already know that the problem is you owe everybody. I'm asking you to borrow more. He's asking her to borrow when her very issue is she owes everybody. Now, as if that's not embarrassing enough, 
if you live in a small village in Bible times and you are in debt to this magnitude where they're threatening to take your children, that would have been common knowledge. In a small village, word gets around. So not only is she asking friends and neighbors and family to borrow, she's asking people who would have known her situation to begin with. Now, it would have been one thing if, if she was able to go to these people and say, hey, I, I've been in a tough spot and um, some crazy stuff happened and God moved and there is oil just pouring out of the faucet at home and I need a bowl to catch all of it. Could I, could I, could I borrow a bowl? Because this is awesome. It, it would have been one thing if she was asking for more because she already saw the provision taking place. But that wouldn't require faith. She would just be a witness to what God already did. Elisha's asking her, I want you to step out in faith, and I want you to go borrow before anything ever happened. So as she's approaching others, and she's asking to borrow vessels, she's gathering based on what she believed God would do. She's not stepping out in faith based on what God had already done. She's stepping out of faith. She's putting herself out there based on what she believed God was going to do in her situation. The miracle here is not initiated by the need. The miracle starts when she steps out in faith. So it wasn't her coming to God or coming to Elisha to speak to God and saying, here's the need, and then all of a sudden, boom, the miracle happens. She presented the need. Elisha spoke to her, she stepped out in faith, and that's what began the miracle. So you not seeing God move in your life isn't because you don't know how to ask God like the other person. Is it because God has favorites? Sometimes I think we get frustrated with God because he hasn't begun to work, but maybe it's because we didn't start off the work. We, we weren't willing to step out in faith. So this, this miracle is initiated by her taking steps to say, God, I'm going to start acting as if what you said is going to happen is going to happen. I don't even know how it's going to look. Doesn't really make sense to me. This seems crazy borrowing when I'm already in debt. But God, if you're asking me to do it, I trust you. I believe you. And so I'm going to step out in faith. And I'm going to go borrow vessels. The second thing that he says to her, he says, I want you to go borrow vessels and make sure that they're empty. Make sure that they're empty. The reason why they needed to be empty was because they needed the capacity to hold what God was going to fill them with. There's something about emptiness, emptiness that provokes filling. So this whole idea of this series that we're in of, of making room is this idea of, God, I can easily fill my schedule, my calendar, my thoughts, my finances, my energy, my effort up with all kinds of things but I am going to give you space to do things in my life. There are areas where I'm going to be intentional about creating room for you to move because I need a move from you. God responds to capacity. God responds to capacity. The person who feels like they are crushing life, like they have everything that they need, is the person who doesn't feel like they need God. It's the person who has hurt, who has pain, who has brokenness. It's the person who realizes anything that they do have that's going well is a gift from God to begin with and realizes I'm nothing without him. Anything good in my life is a result of him. Matthew 5, Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Does anybody enjoy the feeling of being hungry? Does anybody enjoy the feeling of being so thirsty you can't even take it anymore? That's an uncomfortable position. That's an uncomfortable feeling, isn't it? But Jesus is equating it to saying it's those who hunger, those who thirst, those who are stretched, those who are empty, those who are in need are the ones who are going to be filled. Because God responds to capacity. Elisha is instructing her, make sure that they're empty. Because you are going to see, you want to be able to contain what God is going to do. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he says, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Such an awesome promise. 
Isn't it so amazing that, that it says that God provides seed to the sower, not seed for the saver? He provides seed for the sower. The sower is the farmer who doesn't just hold on to the seed, but is faithful to put the seed in the ground. And this funny thing happens when you're faithful to put in the ground what God has already put in your hand, you now have room in your hand for the next thing that God wants to give. He provides seed for the sower because the sower always has capacity for more of what God wants to give. It's the hoarder who's not faithful to sow that's bag is still full, that has no room for what God desires to do. So when you and I are not faithful to put to work what we already could be doing, we're diminishing our own capacity to receive from God what he wants to give us. God gives seed to the sower. When you and I can acknowledge what I could be doing, how I could be praying, what I could be giving, what I could be committing, we're making room. We are giving God capacity to move in our situation. The last bit of advice that he gives her, he says, go borrow vessels, make sure that they're empty. And he says, not too few. Not too few. This is probably Elisha making a connection with her on a natural level to say, I know when you hear me saying, go get vessels, you're probably thinking of a couple or a few. I'm telling you, not too few. I, I'm telling you, dream bigger. Whatever you think God could do, it's more. Not too few. One of my favorite quotes ever is, if, if the vision for your life isn't intimidating to you, it's insulting to God. Elisha's advice when he's telling her step out in faith is, not too few. Not too few. Make room. Put yourself out there. Believe that a, a God can do godly things. A supernatural God who wants to do supernatural things in your life. Not too few. I want to challenge you with this thought. Whatever you are believing God to do in your life in this season is a great measuring stick of who you believe God actually is. You know, so many times I, I will say that I believe that God does this supernatural, but I'm only believing for natural things. What you're believing God to do for your life reveals who you believe that God actually is, what God could actually do. I want to challenge you tonight as we're talking about vision for this year, for 2020, that this would be a year that, that you look back on years from now and say, man, that was the year that changed everything. That, that your kids and grandkids could point back and be like, that's the year that changed the trajectory of our family forever. You want 2020 to be different? You want to begin to, to make room for God to show up and do things that were, are beyond your wildest dreams, things you couldn't even imagine on your own? Not too few. Dream bigger. Lift your vision higher. Believe that a supernatural God desires to do supernatural things in your life. Notice this, it, it wasn't the oil that ran out, it was the jars. He told her, not too few. When one's full, set it aside and get another. When she said to her sons, get me another vessel, they said, we don't have any more, and then it says that the flow stopped. It wasn't the provision that dried up, it was the vessels. Not too few. God's never going to fail you. God's not going to leave you dry. But what happens is in life, when you and I stop making room for God to show up, when we stop creating space, when we stop emptying things out and sowing things that he's given us, you and I, being full, being to capacity, we put ourselves to the side. And then we get envious of how God is using somebody else because they were willing to make room. And the reality is you were the one who took yourself out of the game. You benched yourself because you weren't intentional about giving God space, constantly stepping out in faith, dreaming for big things, believing for big things. And as a result, you've diminished your capacity to receive from God. If you want to keep yourself in the center of God's will for your life, as a church, as a campus, if we want to stay right in the middle of what God is doing, we just got to keep making room. We, we just got to keep putting things before God and say, God, 
this doesn't make sense. God, this is a big dream. God, I know this sounds crazy. God, I know that this doesn't make sense. I know that we couldn't get here in the natural, but you could. I know you could do it. So, God, I'm going to give you room. I'm going to give you space. I'm going to keep just putting things your way. I'm going to keep stepping out in faith, and I'm going to believe that you're going to come through on your end. So cool that what initiates the whole, the oil flowing is when her, her public acts of faith, her going around and collecting all these jars, meet with her, her obedience and her intimacy in private with God. She steps out in faith, and then it's when she comes in and she shuts the door, and it's her and her family, that, and she's obedient with what God asked her to do, that all of a sudden you see this miracle start to take place. When you can pair your public acts of faith with your obedience and your intimacy with God in private, there's no, there's no limit to what God can do in and through you. The third thing that I want to ask you as the band comes up and we begin to wrap this, out, uh, wrap this up is are you living on what's been left? When, when she comes to Elisha and she says, I did everything that you said, and, and all these jars were, were filled with oil, his instructions to her are, okay, take the oil that you have, I want you to go sell it, pay off all your debts, and I want you to live on what's left. Are we living on what's been left? Better yet, are we living on who has been left? You know, if, if I were to, to stand here and I were to say, listen, I'm going to make your night. Jesus told me on my way in here that he was willing to come down and, and pick one of you, and he was going to do life with you from here on out. He's going to go wherever you go. He was going to walk with you, talk with you, be your best friend, never leave your side. He's going to be with you from here on out. You would have so much confidence to be like, oh, life is going to be awesome now. Like, what could happen? I have Jesus, the Son of God, walking with me now. From here on out, it's me and Jesus. That would change everything for you. That changed everything for me. My perspective on life would change. My perspective on what my circumstances and situation currently looks like versus what I believe now would happen, everything would change if I knew that Jesus was going to be walking with me from here on out and never leave my side. But do you know what's so crazy? is that when Jesus is speaking to his disciples and his friends, he actually lets them know, it's better for you that I go so that the Holy Spirit can come. It's better for you. It's going to work out better. If I don't go, he can't come. He says in John 16, he says, I didn't tell you this earlier because I was with you every day. But now I'm on my way to the one who sent me. Not one of you has asked, where are you going? Instead, the longer I've talked, the sadder you've become. So let me say it again. Let me repeat myself. This truth, it's better for you that I leave. If I don't leave, the Spirit won't come. But if I go, I'll send him to you. Paul says this in Ephesians 3. He says, God can do anything, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us. His spirit deeply and gently within us. Jesus says in John 14, Truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. So as a person who has a relationship with God, as a person who has made the decision at some point to accept salvation and accept what Jesus has done for you, I want to ask you tonight, have you been living on who's been left? H have we been approaching life with this idea and this realization that, Jesus, you came and you did what you did, and then you left so that the Holy Spirit could come and do life with me? So that the same Spirit that raised you back to life when you were dead for three days now can live inside of me and can work in me and, 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 and can give me wisdom and direction and clarity and can, can, can push me in certain directions and can lead me to make certain decisions and to say things and not say things and to step out in faith and to do things that I wouldn't normally do or I wouldn't naturally want to do. But because I have him living in me, I have this supernatural connection with my creator. I have this supernatural connection with a supernatural God who desires to do the supernatural in and through me. 
Are we living on who's been left? Man, what, what is it that you need God to do? He starts off, what is it you want me to do? Okay, don't sit there too long. Bring it right back to, so what could you be doing right now? God, God knows your need. God, God, God knows your life. It's not like God has fallen asleep or God has forgotten about you or God lost inventory of everybody. No, God knows the need. What is it that you and I could be doing in the moment? As small as it may seem, as insignificant as it may seem, what could you and I be doing? Are you willing to use it? Are you willing to give it? Are you willing to pray for it? Are you willing to put it to work? And then at the end of the day, are you willing to just live on who's been left? You know what's so awesome? That oil in the Old Testament was symbolic for the Holy Spirit. So the only thing that this woman needed, and it was actually way more than she even needed, was oil, which represents the Holy Spirit for you and me. He's literally all that we need. He's more than we need. It's just too easy to go through life and not acknowledge him. It's too easy to go through life and, and not make a concerted effort to speak to him and communicate with him and to ask him to lead us and guide us and speak to us and show us and to move in our situation. We're going to do something a little bit different tonight. And uh, our host, I'm going to invite to come forward. You know, I asked you last week, I gave you a little bit of homework and said, I want you to, to pray and seek God of what, what is the purpose that you have for me in this season of life? What, what, what areas do I need you to move? What do you have for me here? And if you weren't here last week, that's all right. Maybe, maybe while we've been talking, there have been some areas that have been coming to your mind tonight of where you need God to move, where you need God to show up. Our hosts are about to pass out these keychains. I think people usually use these to stash pills. I'm asking you to not do that. And now I have a clear conscience. If you do it, it's on you. As you get a, a keychain, I want to invite you to grab a pen out of the bucket as well. And if you, if you spin this open, you're going to find a piece of paper stashed inside. And on this paper, we've written down where we feel like you need to work on. <laughs> I'm just kidding. This is mine from Sunday. I, I want to take a few minutes before we move on tonight, before we close out the night. And, and, and I want to symbolically give you an opportunity to ask God right now, to ask the Holy Spirit, hey, what, what areas do I need you to move in? What, what things have I just accepted as normal? Have I just accepted as life? Have I just thought to myself, I guess that's never going to change. I guess that relationship is never coming back. I guess, you know, that person's never going to know you. I don't see how this is all going to work out. I guess I just got to move on. I guess I got to just live with this pain, live with this hurt. I want you just to begin to, to think, reflect for a moment. Where do you need God to show up? What, what areas of life, what relationships, what people are you going to believe that this year God is going to move in? What, what, what areas are you willing to make some room? Are you willing to get serious and say, I am going to believe and step out in faith that this year this will change? That this year this person is going to come to know you, God that this year this relationship will be mended, that, that this will come full circle, that, that this year that these needs will be met, that I'll experience breakthrough in this area. As the Holy Spirit begins to just bring things to your mind, I want you to write these things on this piece of paper. When you're done with that, you can roll it back up. I want to give you some advice to spare you 20 minutes of frustration. Stick the paper in the cap first and then screw the bottom on. But I want to just give you a couple minutes. Just begin to ask the Lord, God, what areas of my life do you want to work in this year? Where do I need you to show up? Write those down and, and put it in there when you're done.
ask you to, to do something. As you have some things or some people, some situations, some relationships written down in here, I want to ask you to place this on your keys, on a nightstand. I've had this on my dresser since Sunday so that every morning when I'm getting my wallet and my watch on, I see this. And I'm reminded when I see this container, this vessel, I'm going to make room and believe that God's going to show up and do something powerful in my life this year. For these specific situations, I'm believing that in 2021, I'm going to be unscrewing this and checking things off the paper. I believe that these areas, God is going to show up. And, and even if it doesn't end up the way that I think it's going to end up, it's going to end up how it should be. Because God is faithful and God is good. I want to ask you to stand tonight as we, we wrap this up and we close out. We have a, a prayer team that's going to be standing along the back in a couple seconds here. And if you're, if you're here tonight and you could use some encouragement, maybe you could just use an ear to be able to speak to and just get some things off your chest. We got a team back there that would love to just pray with you, encourage you, listen to you, give you a hug. So if you're here tonight, you can use prayer about anything. It might not even be about what we talked about. You can make your way back there as soon as we start this song. They'd love to pray with you. For the rest of us, do you guys mind just holding these up? Can we pray for these things right now? Can we just dedicate these things for this year right now back to God? Jesus, we, we thank you so much for everything that you've done for us. God, even if you never did another thing for us, you've already done more than we would ever deserve. But God, we know that you're faithful. We know that you're good. We know that you love us as your children. And God, we, we come boldly before you tonight with situations and circumstances in mind, with relationships and people in mind. And God, we, we pray right now that you would begin to work in every person, in every relationship, in every situation, in every circumstance. God, we are giving you these things tonight. And Holy Spirit, we give you permission from tonight and moving on to, to bring to our attention what we could be doing, how we could be praying, what we could be giving, what we could be committing, the effort that we could be making. I pray that when I begin to get caught up in life and distracted with things, that you would remind me that I need to make room for God to move. I pray that if I ever position myself to be full or, or taking myself out of God's will, that you would just give me that gentle reminder that I need to constantly be stepping out in faith, constantly be giving you opportunities to show up in my life. God, we thank you that you never stop being faithful. It's just who you are. We love you so much tonight. We worship you. In Jesus' name.